probably that'll take enough time for some, some more people to file in as I'm talking. So um, good afternoon and welcome to our discussion of Dr. Sebastian Hubel's book, Fighter, Worker and Family Man, German Jewish Men and Their Gendered Experiences in Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1941, out now with University of Toronto Press. Um, I'm Professor Chad Gibbs, Director of the Zucker Goldberg Center for Holocaust Studies at the College of Charleston, and I'll be serving as the chair for our event today. Uh, please be aware that the event is being recorded. I have a few acknowledgments and introductions to make, as well as some technical details to discuss before handing things over to Sebastian um, for him to tell us about his excellent new book. First, I'd like to acknowledge the staff and supporters of the organizations underwriting today's event. Uh, this book launch is made possible by the University of Wisconsin-Madison History Department, the George L. Mossy Program in History at UW-Madison, and the Zucker Goldberg Center for Holocaust Studies at the College of Charleston, and also the UW-Madison Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, we thank them all for bringing us together today. Sebastian's discussion of his book will be followed today by comments from Professor Sarah Imhoff. Uh, Imhoff is the J and Jeannie Schottenstein, or Schottenstein, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, Chair in Jewish Studies and Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies and the Bournes Jewish Studies Program at Indiana University. She writes about religion and the body with a particular interest in gender, sexuality, disability, and American religion, as well as maintaining a research specialty in religion and the law. She is author of Masculinity and the Making of American Judaism with Indiana University Press in 2017 and The Lives of Jesse Samter, Queer Disabled Zionist, Duke University Press in 2022. She's the founding co-editor of the journal American Religion, and she's also working on a co-authored book with Susanna Heschel about women and gender in Jewish studies that will be out with Princeton University Press in 2023. Our author today is Dr. Sebastian Hubel, who was born in Germany and together with his family moved to British Columbia, Canada in 2001. Sebastian uh, studied history and geography at the undergraduate level at Thompson Rivers University, completed a master's degree at the University of Victoria, where he studied the Berlin and Vienna Philharmonic Orchestras in the Third Reich. Sebastian completed his PhD at the University of British Columbia, UBC in Vancouver, his interests lie in modern German history and the Holocaust and its intersections with gender. Sebastian has been a lecturer at the University of the Fraser Valley since 2018. In his free time, Sebastian enjoys uh, fishing and beekeeping. Uh, today, Sebastian will provide a discussion of his book, followed by a comment from Professor Imhoff, uh, and then I will moderate a Q&A from the audience. Uh, we'll facilitate that Q&A by reading your questions that you type into the Q&A format at the bottom of your screens. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hubel. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. Greetings from British Columbia, from Canada. On this, I guess, very historic day, probably many of you have heard that the Queen just passed away not too long ago. and. I didn't realize what an impact this actually would have here in Canada, because, you know, the Queen technically was the head of state, of course, in Canada. So there's going to be quite a few conversations and discussions in the next few hours and days to come, so to speak. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to talk a little bit about my book. First of all, also many thanks go to the organizers, of course, Chad and Sky. Sarah, very pleased to have you. Look forward to hearing your comments. Many thanks go to the University of Madison, the History Department, the Department of Jewish Studies, and the College of Charleston, of course, as well. Also, apologies. I mean, English is my second language. I hope my accent is not too bad. I do sound a little congested. Of course, perfect timing. Two and a half years into the pandemic, it finally caught up with me. But I'm feeling pretty fine, except for that strange sound coming <laughs> through my nose. Okay, I guess without further ado, um, yeah, I would like to give the audience a bit of an overview slash um, rundown of my, uh, of my book that was published last December um, by the University of, uh, of Toronto Press. And yeah, I guess we can just jump in right away. 
So when I started this book project, um, we have to go back 10, 12 years or so when I started my PhD at UBC in Vancouver. And, you know, as typically it's the case as a graduate student, I was confronted with the, with the kind of um, conundrum, so to speak, to find a suitable research project that hasn't been overdone, so to speak. As a PhD student, you're expected to create new scholarship and, of course, make some contribution to, to new scholarship, of course. And coupled with my interest in German history, the history of Nazi Germany and the Third Reich and the Holocaust, I basically started digging a little bit deeper. And I ended up with this very, very specific topic, arguably very, very specific topic, German Jewish masculinities in pre-war Nazi Germany. And it turned into a promising idea. And some of you now might wonder why so specific, why German Jewish men in pre-war or the pre-Holocaust period, so to speak. And I think there's a few for it. And maybe I would like to go over them first and then talk a little bit about you know, my research, my methodology and so on. And then maybe give a brief synopsis of some of my case studies or, or chapters to speak. Um, I found, and hopefully many of you will agree with this, that there's already a kind of inexhaustible corpus of literature on the Holocaust. I think there's few other fields in, in human history that have seen such a production of scholarly, um, books and articles or non-scholarly uh, World War II, the Holocaust um, rank, I'm sure, in the top five. So what I'm trying to say here is it was not so easy to you know, narrow down a new topic. And what I did notice is that there's noticeably less literature, academic literature, on the pre-war years. So the ones who have looked at my book or had a chance to read a couple of chapters and whatnot, my focus is on the 1933 to, say, 1941 era. You can talk about this a little bit later, why 1941? Do I end exactly in that year or not? But uh, what I'm trying to say is um, I found for my research project, the study of masculinities, German Jewish masculinities, the era of the pre-war years to be more, say, insightful or more promising. And now, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes. The other thing I noticed once I started narrowing down my topic is that and I was kind of surprised about this, actually. There is quite a bit of literature already on gender studies on Jewish gender studies that intersect with Holocaust studies. Much of that literature or that historiography did focus on women. The authors were often um, feminist historians or feminist scholars, and they have made great contributions and have contributed to major, major important seminal works. Um, just to name maybe two uh, historians here that were largely influential on in my uh, my studies and Marian Kaplan's book in the late 1990s, Between Dignity and Despair, and it was a very influential book on me. And that, of course, focuses on the, on the Jewish side, right? Jewish women in Nazi Germany, also with a kind of focus on the pre-war years. Or um, Claudia Kuhn's um, focuses more on, on German women, non-Jewish, but German women. And of course, she goes into, you know, uh, examinations of perpetrators, et cetera, et cetera. And there, just to give a few examples here, maybe to, to, to establish a common ground here, what feminist historiography kind of have already um, contributed, if one thinks of forced sterilizations of women in Nazi Germany, because these women were deemed racially inferior, not worthy of reproduction. If you think of forced prostitution and various Nazi concentration camps, if you think of the many choiceless choices Jewish and non-Jewish mothers had to make, places like Auschwitz when they were told to line up at the selection lines. So long story short, what this, this established literature has taught me is that Nazi terror was gendered, highly gendered, and so were many of the reaction as well. So having read through some of this, this very important pertinent scholarship, it became, however, evident that there was a bit of a desideratum, a gap in the literature and that what I'm referring to here is that there were only few or isolated studies that did look at Jewish men's perspective during this crucial time in history. And the existing literature that did look at Jewish men through the lens of gender often looked at concentration camps, this, you know, this kind of microcosm of, of, of emasculation of the gendered attack against Jewish men. But again, in this kind of confined space, the Katzeck, the concentration camp. But the premise that, you know, history is his story, that history is a story written by men, about men, because men are in powerful positions. Of course, this argument carries a lot of weight, um, but it does not withstand close scrutiny when it comes to 
marginalized men, because I think it's safe to say that men also are vulnerable, they too can constitute and belong to groups of minorities. They, like I said, they get marginalized, they can get singled out. Emasculated is a very heavy, loaded term. I'll talk more about it in, in a few minutes. And of course, men can get victimized and killed. And there are scholars, not necessarily historians, but there are scholars who make the argument that typically in an armed conflict and a war, the first victims of physical violence are actually men. There's the scholar Adam Jones who calls this gender side. And he's not saying that men are only, the only victims, of course, of physical violence. Uh, that's, that's nonsense. Uh, women are also, I mean, I just gave a few examples, right? Of forced sterilization, of rape, of forced prostitution and so on. But this term gender side, I think is, is, is quite, uh, is quite um, stimulating, it's quite intriguing. And I've used it many times in my classrooms to have discussions and I experienced it. Students at the post-secondary level really like to talk about gender when it comes to Nazi Germany, when it comes to World War II, when it comes to the Holocaust. So that kind of also you know, stimulated my interest and it was a bit of a, a driving motivation, so to speak, to have to, to see this kind of interest in the in, in the workspace and in the place that I work and the people that I engage with, so to speak. Um, but my research, and I really want to make this very clear here at the very beginning, is it, in no way does it intend to, you know, trivialize, downplay, negate, um, disparage the scholarship, again, that very important scholarship that feminist um, historians have written. What my intention really is, or was, I guess, well, it's an ongoing project, um, is to fill a hole in the existing literature, in the existing historiography, and that really one that, and that that's one that kind of complements or supplements, I should say, uh, the existing works, and they can work together in tandem with that previous scholarship. Because studies on femininity, studies on masculinity, they only function, my humble opinion, in, 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 yeah, in tandem, in combination. It has to be considered or understood synthetically, so to speak. What constitutes cultural understandings of masculinity is predicated or contingent on notions of femininity and vice versa. So you probably can already get a sense here that I'm more of a kind of cultural constructivist. I'm very interested in the production of images, depictions, cultural constructions of gender, um, the lived experiences, the performances of gender based on what it meant to be a man or a woman at any given time in the past. So my focus is on German Jewish men, at the time of the Holocaust. But because gender is relational, we need one to understand the other. So again, this is not an exclusive study. And even though my focus is on Jewish masculinity, I basically rely quite a lot actually, again, on that existing historiography that looks at women and feminist scholarship. So my study is not meant to resemble, and again, that's another thing I really wanna make clear here, for the ones who might be a little less familiar with this work. Uh, my study is not meant to be it's not meant to resemble a kind of competition who suffered more men versus women, or in this case, Jewish men versus uh, Jewish men, or Jewish women, so to speak. It is a study to better understand German Jews in this case, or German Jewish men through the lens of gender, the gendered experiences and the perspectives in kind of a larger context and in relation to the gendered assaults that the Nazis undertook. So my central pursuit then in a, in a sense in, in the study was to kind of illustrate, to analyze, to discuss really how German Jewish men experienced, you know, these emasculating years as men, as, and that includes now a number of case studies that I would like to you know, introduce you guys to. Um, emasculating, but it is the experience of emasculation through the lens of Jewish men being law-abiding citizens. So I'm looking in this chapter as, you know, German Jewish men identifying as German, as citizens of, of, that, of that country, Germany, where they were born in, where they wanted, where they you know, lived their entire lives, and where they wanted to continue living their lives as German Jewish men. Another case study looks at German Jewish men in the case study of military masculinity, how these Jewish men identified as veterans, as patriots, again, kind of related to that first chapter of, of, of citizenship. In citizenship and military masculinity do intersect, and I'll go into that in a, in a little bit more detail here in a minute. Other case studies look at German Jewish men as fathers, as husbands, 
as men with sexual desires. So I'm kind of trying to break up these constructions, these notions of masculinity that are culturally constructed, that are socially lived, and I kind of basically analyze and examine how these notions, how these constructions changed, if at all, during the reign um, of the Nazis. My argument then basically is that these men that I looked at, and it's actually, yeah, a few hundreds, um, though being assaulted by a murderous and racist regime, these German Jewish men, that's my argument, persevered to a very large extent in upholding their understandings of established masculinity. And this includes performative adherence to many of these culturally established or pre-established gender norms, values, behaviors, and yeah, performances. Albeit, of course, under drastically different circumstances, but until the bitter end. Um, the reason I chose to focus my study on Germany and the pre-war years, just to, to add to this, to augment again a little bit background here, um, is number one, I opted for more depth than breadth. So I fully realized that this is a national history and not a transnational history. Um, but again, it did allow me to go deeper and look at one specific group, German Jewish men in this case, over you know, this, this span of 12 plus years actually, because I look into cultural constructions, I go back into the 19th century and kind of analyze how some of these constructions um, emerged, how they were formed and how they kind of evolved over time, so to speak. But yes, it is a national history. Other more, I guess, well, reasons include, you know, language barriers. I'm fluent in German, English, but I'm not fluent in Polish and say, I don't know, French or other languages so that can be a dilemma for Holocaust historians, of course. And the other reason, like I said before, is um, this kind of study did allow me to look not just at the years, say 1941 to 45, Again, that kind of is often the focus of Holocaust historians, but I did think, or I did come to the conclusion that an analysis of the pre-war years actually could, could be almost be more fruitful, so to speak, because it was in this year, or sorry, in this phase, say 1933 to say 1939, 40, 41, so to speak, uh, but the Nazi regime did try actively to emasculate German Jews, including Jewish men and women, but where many of these German Jews still try to live normal lives, where they try to adapt to the non-adaptable, so to speak, to try to adapt to this Nazi avalanche of discrimination, persecution, where they were trying to normalize their not so normal lives. And of course, this might be a little bit more challenging to do when it really comes to the core years of the Holocaust, when you know Europe's Jews were deported into the gas chambers, extermination camps, places like Auschwitz, the labor camps, the ghettos, et cetera, et cetera. But my core focus really is on when German Jews, again, the 1930s basically, were still living at home in their homes and were trying to adapt. And my focus is how did Jewish men try to do that, try to accomplish that. Methodologically, um, I did organize, organize my book into case studies, um, five, six case studies with a chronological order in mind. So I was trying to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, the chapters are case studies on a specific topic, but at the same time, I'm using a chronology um, as well. So I started in the early 30s, the early 40s, so to speak. And based on actually uh, Thomas Kuhnes pioneering work, you know, one of the earliest, uh, well, I don't know if the earliest, but very important um, gender historians and masculinity who also looked at, of course, uh, Nazi Germany. Um, I tried to kind of use his very, um, yeah, very excellent methodology. And I tried to look at three different layers or three different um, realms of the speak when it comes to deconstructing um, 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 German Jewish masculinity. The first field would be looking at the cultural, the discursive kind of realm, so to speak. What, and then ask myself, what were some of the accepted and expected gender norms in Germany at the time? And then how were these Jewish men or German Jewish men kind of culturally, symbolically, discursively, linguistically, graphically, say in the media, uh, think of Nazi propaganda, et cetera. How were they emasculated? How were they ridiculed? And therefore, or thereby denied, denied membership 
of what we call hegemonic masculinity, mainstream masculinity. So this is the, the, the cultural realm, the words, the images, the, the speeches, the, the, the broadcasts, the newspapers, the film posters. My second layer then of analysis was to scrutinize basically how such cultural constructions of Aryan masculinity vis-a-vis -vis Jewish masculinity, how they were translated into something more concrete, something more tangible, into specific, say, Nazi laws, directives, policies um, that then directly, you know, impacted German Jewish men and their families. So the direct implications, so to speak, in terms of their self-understandings as men. Maybe just to give two examples here before I become too, philosophical, too, too methodological or theoretical, um, German Jewish men um, were excluded from the military, the newly established military, the Wehrmacht in 1935. But that is a specific example that has strongly gendered connotations. And that comes from that cultural realm. In the cultural realm, the Nazis, but not only the Nazis, there's a prehistory, you know, Jewish men were ridiculed. They're not manly, they're effeminate, they're not tough, they can't serve in the military. Uh, they, are, they, 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 they shy away from serving for the fatherland, et cetera, et cetera. So that is an example of that, 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 that cultural realm and then it kind of how it percolates into the social realm, the more tangible realm, so to speak. And that's one example, being barred from the military. One other example would be, you know, one of the Nazi laws, quite ridiculous, um, Jewish um, maids were not allowed to work in German households, so, so to speak. Oh, sorry, the other way around, actually. Under the age of 45, German women were not allowed to work in Jewish households. And so that's a specific law, incredibly specific, actually. And of course, this begs the question when this was the case. And again, highly, highly gendered. The idea slash fantasy was um, that German women under the age of 45 might fall victim to the Jewish male owner or head of that household, so to speak, who might be sexually exploitive. So again, the notions, the constructs, these, these the, the language, the images that are there, and then they kind of get translated, so to speak, into, into social reality. However, arguably, the, 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 the main focus in my book is the, the third layer, and that is the more lived experience, the, the, yeah, the experience. That's where I kind of enter the psychological realm, so to speak. How did the Jewish men that I looked at in my study, how did they experience? the cultural realm and the kind of more social realm. So the, the, the language, the discrimination, propaganda, but also the laws, like the specific, yeah, like I said, laws or, or, or deeds that the Nazis basically executed. How did the German, how did German Jews, not exclusively German Jewish men, but how did German Jews um, react to these kind of gendered um, um, yeah, onslaughts, so to speak, against them? So, that's kind of the methodology. And hopefully this makes a little sense, even though it's a little dry, but I think this is this is the kind of group, right? Where we should talk about research, methodology, and, 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 and sometimes a little bit of theory and whatnot. So maybe to give you a bit of a quick rundown here, also having time in mind, um, chapter one looks at military masculinity, as I mentioned, or what role the military played in Wilhelmine, Germany, turn of the 19th to the 20th century, so to speak, and how this kind of how these notions of military masculinity. Uh, they were carried over into the post war era. Super quick background, World War I, um, over 100,000 Jewish men did serve in the German army out of a population of over half a million or so, so a significant number. They had served their country in the First World War. And for many of these German Jewish men that I looked at, middle-class German Jewish men, highly acculturated Jewish men, we probably will talk about this acculturated later, um, this group that really constitutes the majority of, of, of the sources that I looked at, or that presented themselves to me, I should say, they served in the war, they had considered the war as a trial of manhood, and they thought they had passed that trial. They had served in the army, they had received the respect, or they thought they would receive now this respect, they felt included within German society, and they deserved that kind of inclusion. They had shown to non-Jews that they were tough, they were loyal, steadfast, like every other man, so to speak, in the trenches. And for these veterans, these German Jewish men born, say, in 1900, in the 1890s, constructions of gender were highly intertwined uh, with notions of citizenship, 
gender, citizenship, it's very interconnected. They have proven themselves as soldiers. They had shown the love, sacrifice, devotion to the country. And as a result, they deserve to be respected citizens in this country, including 1933 and beyond when Hitler came to power. And for that reason, many thought leaving Germany, emigrating from Germany is unthinkable. It's not gonna happen. It would resemble you know, being a coward, running away from danger. We didn't do that in the trenches of World War I. We're not going to do it now. We're going to weather the storm, so to speak. They are resorting to, to, to practices um, that they had tried out, experimented with in, the, in their earlier lives, so to speak. And they tried to apply it in the Nazi period. Germany was their home, their place of social, cultural recognition and achievement. So what I'm trying to show in this case study is two things, basically. German Jewish men were re more reluctant. I know I'm generalizing here. But again, I'm looking at hundreds of sources and not just one or two case studies. Generally speaking, they were more reluctant to apply for immigration visas to get out of Germany while it was technically still possible. Whereas Jewish women, again, in general, had fewer reservations to give up what they had built and start a new life abroad. And this is an example of where my scholarship kind of complements the existing historiography because Marion Kaplan has really nicely illustrated how proactive women were in mobilizing their families to get out of Nazi Germany. And now here's my side that illuminates uh, the, the, the inner despair or turmoil that Jewish men were in and how military masculinity was part of their DNA that they did not want to give up. So the chapter relates to Jewish reactions to Nazi anti-Semitism, politics, media, newspapers, radio, school curricula, which was countered by German Jews in these very highly, highly gendered ways. So in this case, in militaristic ways, I actually have a photo, I guess I do should share my screen here, but again, being very cognizant of time. Um, one of the photos that I show in my book here, can you guys see this? Is anyone able to confirm, can see my slideshow? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay. Perfect. So here we see a few of these images when it comes to military masculinity, how, say, at the turn of the century, Jewish men were ridiculed, emasculated, made fun of, so to speak, they're weaker, they are more fragile, so to speak, they're basically not suitable to serve in the military. And then when it comes to these reactions, like I said, whether the storm, not give up, not leave the country, not leave the battlefield, we can see these kind of highly gendered reactions. And it is one of several photographs I study in quite detail in my book. Uh, this one, I think it speaks a thousand words, this photograph. We see the April 1933 boycott when the Nazis basically started an anti-Jewish boycott, telling Germans don't buy from Jews, um, boycott the stores, so to speak. Some Germans did, some didn't, different story. But what I find very intriguing in this photograph is, of course, we see the stormtroopers, the SA here, um, you know, trying to stop Germans from entering the stores. And then we see the reaction by German Jews. And again, in this case, German Jewish men. Uh, this is a Richard Stern, city of this Cologne. And he was giving us an answer. There's a reaction. And what did he put onto his jacket? The World War I medal. He did, decided not to close the store. He decided to keep the store open, so to speak. And what's even more, he was performing military masculinity, telling the Nazis, the neighbors, fellow citizens in his town, I'm one of you and I deserve to stay here and I deserve not to get discriminated. Why? Because I've proven my citizenship. I've proven my involvement in this country. I have served the military. I've served the fatherland. I do not deserve this kind of treatment. And this was a highly gendered reaction. So notions of masculinity, or in this case, military, military, militarism and citizenship, very much interconnect. And this is of course also something that George Moss, right? Has, has done in his pioneering uh, work. Um, and, um, in, in the 1990s. So I also very much rely on and, and, and benefited from his groundbreaking work here as well. And the other thing that, I, that brings me, this, this case study brings me back to is how into, intricately relational gender is. And so it was not just Jewish men who kind of resorted to this answer to Nazi anti-Semitism, but Jewish women as well. So very relational and often in, in, in kind of the symbiosis, so to speak, Jewish women also performed military masculinity. One or two examples, um, German Jewish women would, for instance, complain, actively complain about you know, the anti-Semitic laws that were passed in the early 1930s by Hitler's regime. They would send letters to Hitler or sometimes to other high 
functionaries, politicians, including actually President Hindenburg. They would send letters complaining, this is not how German Jews deserve to be treated. And one of the evidence or, or a very common typical evidence they would list these, with these female authors is their uncles and fathers and husbands and whatnot military service in World War I. So again, a very kind of highly gendered reaction sentence. Okay, gonna talk a little faster here. Chapter two looks at anti-Semitic propaganda. Um, this is also kind of a topic that has much been written about, sometimes with, through the lens of gender, sometimes not so much. Um, but again, of course, stating the obvious, in the end, the Nazis did not differentiate, you know, when the genocide actually started between men and women, when it came to implementing their genocidal plan, so to speak. But in the early years, we can actually see striking differences uh, that can be observed when it comes to Nazi propaganda, Nazi anti-Semitism. And yeah, in a nutshell, Nazi ideology, and again, many of you, I think everyone knows this here, was very much predicated on this notion of of, of protecting the German gene pool, the German blood, the German race, so to speak. And the Nazis considered, this is very illogical, of course, and highly misogynistic, again, stating the obvious, the Nazis considered men as, phys as the physically stronger sex that is more active, perhaps, or more aggressive, more dominant. So in the Nazi rhetoric, it was German women who needed to be protected from Jewish men because these Jewish men had nothing better in their mind than to, you know, be lecherous Jewish men, uh, to, to go after Jewish women, uh, German women, so to speak, and defile, pollute the German race pool. And again, there's a lot of propaganda material I will show you probably at the end of the lecture just to, to, to kind of keep time here in mind, so to speak. There's, there's, there's many images that are highly, highly gendered and that basically show the evil Jew through the depictions of the Jewish male. And that's not a coincidence, I think. These cultural discourses then would translate, again, second layer or second yeah, layer of my methodology, translate into specific Nazi legislation or policy, the one I already mentioned, um, where um, you know, German maids were not allowed to work in Jewish households under the age of 45, and apparently they were still looking attractive and, and, and whatnot, and where they could fall victim to Jewish male aggression. And then, of course, the third layer again is to see how the Jewish men actually react to these, to, to, yeah, to this anti-Semitism, to these policies, and to these, these discourses. And my research has shown that some did react, and they took this very, very seriously. They feared denunciations, race defilement. These, these accusations, race defilement in the mid-1930s was serious business. Hundreds of men were actually brought to court and were sentenced and ended up in concentration camps. So they thought twice, am I going out on the weekend? Am I going to meet someone in a bar? Some stopped doing that. While at the same time, others said, no, um, I'm not looking Jewish. I do not correspond with this Nazi propaganda that is now so virulent and, and disseminated all, 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 over, all over German society, so to speak. I take the risk or I do not identify as a man at risk, so to speak. So a very heterogeneous kind of mosaic or canvas um, of reactions. In chapters three and four, I look at Jewish husbands and fathers. And I think that's an exploration that in a sense is a bit overdue. It goes into the field of, of history of emotions. I think it's a bit of more of a newer field, the history of emotions, especially in relation. So again, these, these, these culturally embedded notions of, of, of men being providers, the, the supposed provider, the breadwinner, the protector of their families, of their spouses, their wives, their, their, their children, et cetera, et cetera. And as you probably can surmise, it's a very emotional chapter. It outlines the pain, the agony, the desperation of many of these men who were trying their very best you know, to, to, to sustain themselves and their families. Again, in these very performative roles, being the breadwinner, being the protector, being the head of a household. And because many Jewish men faced unemployment in pre-war Nazi Germany, and again, I'm not saying only Jewish men faced unemployment, that's, that's of course nonsense, but I'm looking at Jewish men and how they reacted to the dooming unemployment. What did they do? How did they react? How did they deal with these existential crises? Again, through the lens of gender. And many did face destitution, of course, and impoverishment. And that study basically showed how many Jewish men began trying to persevere in these roles. They retrained. 
they took on new professions. A professor, a lawyer, a, a, a judge, a, a, a highly educated person becomes a salesperson, a solicitor. Someone starts fixing bikes on the weekend. People, some of these people that I looked at started working on the black market just to bring home some money to keep the family afloat, so to speak. So yeah, a very emotional chapter. Same goes, of course, with um, uh, the other side of the spectrum. Some did not persevere. So again, I'm not trying to generalize here, say everything was great. Of course, it's not great. It's a very sad, emotional story that we're talking about here. And the struggles were real. And many of the Jewish men that I looked at uh, resorted to depressive behaviors, alcoholism, passiveness, and suicide. When we look at suicide statistics, for, in, for, for instance, very interesting, for lack of a better word. Um, there's a gender discrepancy in pre Nazi Germany. It was more Jewish men who committed suicide. And I think a lot has to do with what I'm trying to say here, this, 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 this pressure to perform, to adhere to these gender roles of being breadwinners, fathers, protectors, and so on. So. In the final two chapters, yeah, it's totally 40 in Canada. Okay, um, five minutes. Is that okay, Sarah? Oh, everyone, I hope so. <laughs> The final two chapters of the book um, highlight the use of gendered physical violence, again, in pre war Nazi Germany, and of course, the gendered reactions there too. So for instance, probably unsurprising, the virulent anti-Semitism, the propaganda did have tangible effects on German society. You know, the, the, the Nazis often portrayed the Jew in this kind of idiosyncratic Jewish male phenotype, so to speak, and then applied these kinds of traits, these characteristics. All Jews, quad, Jewish male, they are threats, they are devious, they are dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of pseudo-scientific nonsense, but it was effective to some degree. So if you looked Jewish and you were male in pre-war Nazi Germany, you were at a higher risk. If you were Jewish, of course, or not, by the way, it didn't really matter. You look Jewish, you could end up actually in trouble. So what I'm looking here in this chapter is the street violence, the street brutality that increased, that became more prevalent. Um, if you think of one very famous example, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, many Jewish homes were invaded, desecrated, ruined, and 30,000 German Jews were deported into concentration camps, 30,000, 30,000 men, 30,000 males. Many did not survive, um, different story, and many, were only released months later if they could prove or show that they were able to leave the country. And also if they could prove that they actually had fought in the first world war, had served the country. So in a sense here, my cycle is closing or kind of, it, it, it becomes a cycle. I'd already talked in chapter one about military masculinity. And then here we see it in this kind of case study of physical violence. And again, that microcosm of concentration camps, we can see how military masculinity was applied and could actually result in, in, in positive or in, 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 yeah, in, in, in positive results, so to speak. You could leave the camp earlier. Or another kind of uh, interesting angle here is it was easier for men who applied or performed military masculinity. It was easier for these men to withstand the, the Nazi brutality in these camps. If you could show to the Nazi perpetrator that you were okay with accepting orders, be stand fast, you know, be silent, follow the orders, whatnot you had a bit of an easier time actually in these camps. So military masculinity has different facets, so to speak, or, or comes, to, comes to the fore in, in different ways, so to speak. And same thing, chapters three and four look at Jewish men as, as fathers, as husbands. These roles, very fascinating. And again, highly emotional. The Jewish men were also trying to uphold these, these, these roles in the camp. These uh, correspondence or, or through correspondence, letter correspondence with their wives, with their children. Jewish men incarcerated in concentration camps, giving their kids advice, be good at school, pay attention, listen to your teacher, giving advice to their spouses. This is how you have to file a tax form. Uh, this is what you should do, sell the house, sell the furniture, so you guys are okay. So it's, it's highly, again, like highly, highly emotional because it was these Jewish men who were technically confined to a passive role, right? They couldn't leave the camp. Many would not survive the camp. And yet here they are trying to act like men the way they understood manhood. They felt responsible. 
And I end the study out of the beginning of the deportations east, the death camps. That's actually my final dissertation chapter, but not a final book chapter. I was able to publish it in Shofar in, uh, yeah, in an academic journal a few years ago. And that chapter basically looks at how Jewish men and women try to defy, yeah, defy the deportation order, saying, no, we are not allowing ourselves to be shipped east. We are going under underground deportation works, we're trying to survive this war, we're trying to withstand the Nazi machinery, this, this genocidal apparatus, so to speak, and we're trying to wait until the end. And this was highly, highly gendered. I have looked at or have seen Jewish men who didn't dare to walk on the street during the war when they were trying to you know, defy the Nazi deportation orders, sending women to find shelter, food and whatnot, because they were less suspicious on the street. Jewish men, middle-aged, not wearing a military uniform during wartime, say Berlin, Highly suspicious. They would check. They would have to present some ID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was a gendered reaction. The Jewish men that I looked at, who did appear in the public, so to speak, tried to circumvent the danger. Circumcision, by the way, is one of the dangers also that I didn't even mention yet. But they tried to have fake military ID. Again, military masculinity comes to mind. Some of them actually wore Nazi uniforms, SS uniforms, Wehrmacht uniforms, to look non-Jewish. I mean, of course, it's a highly, highly gendered reaction. And believe it or not, I've come across a couple of case studies or, or, or examples where Jewish men started dressing up as females, wearing women's clothes, not to look male. <laughs> highly fascinating in a sense, of course. So as these various examples hopefully illustrate, um, Nazi genocide against Europe's Jews, not German Jews, Europe's Jews, was not linear. It was not a straightforward path. It was a series of evolving tactics different forms of discrimination and persecution, many of which were gendered, sometimes more implicit, sometimes more explicit, but I think so were the reactions by Europe's Jews, German Jews, who tried to live a normal life during these highly abnormal times. Thank you. What time is it? 45. I don't know, chat, Sky. Hopefully I didn't go over the time limit. No, but I should be quiet now. Uh, we'll just pass over to Sarah for her comments now. And thank you for that wonderful introduction of your books, Sebastian. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for having me. Uh, I'm gonna do exactly the opposite of the standard academic thing where I say this question is more of a comment, but I'm gonna instead say these comments are more questions. Um, so I'll offer you a really quick summary and then a couple of reflections and a couple of more explicit questions. Um, as you've heard here this afternoon, Sebastian has brought our attention to a subject that maybe we thought we already knew about, how Jewish men were seen during the Third Reich. But as I hope you found while you listened to him, perhaps we didn't know as much as we thought we did. Sebastian takes his analysis in two important directions that are less obvious in existing literature. First, he asks about these Jewish men as men, not just how they were portrayed. Um, not just how they were portrayed as Jews, but how masculinity played a role in their experiences. And second, he asks not just how the Nazis and the Third Reich portrayed these men, but also how they saw themselves, how they thought of their own gender, how they reacted to assaults on, the, assaults on their sense of manhood. He finds things that we might have predicted. For example, that Nazi ideology and propaganda painted Jewish men as bad men or not even really men at all. Um, they were weak, they were dirty, they were disloyal. But he also finds things that are far less obvious, such as how Jewish war veterans could, at least for a while, successfully deploy their medals and accomplishments as buffers to shore up their masculinity. And this worked even in the eyes of many Nazis. So as I'm thinking about this, um, I'm particularly interested in some of the, uh, let's call them particulars of Jewish masculinity in the Third Reich. Once we understand that masculinity is not essential, that it's different in different times and places, we become alert to the specific ways that men are expected to behave and the specific ways that they see themselves. Sebastian shows that Jews and Nazis actually shared a lot of their ideals about what made a good man. He was heterosexual, he was a father, he was a productive worker, he probably had military experience. He was neither too fat nor too thin. 
he was able-bodied and not physically weak. So here's something I find fascinating. It was in part because they agree on so many of these things that the Nazis could so effectively weaponize gender. Because Jewish men invested some of their masculine self-worth in their work, it shamed and it harmed them when the Nazis deprived them of their work. Because Jewish men experienced pride in raising children, it hurt their sense of selves when they became unable to protect those children. Um, so I'm also interested to hear from Sebastian if there were ways that Jewish men's ideals differed from Nazi ideals. I mean, there are reasons we might think they might not. Many of these German Jews were quite acculturated. It's entirely possible they shared almost all of their ideals. Um, but I'd be interested to hear from you about that. I also noted the way that Nazi propaganda and policies demonized Jewish men in some particular ways, but not other particular ways. That is, they didn't just say everything bad about Jews. They seemed to choose particular bad things and harp on those particular bad things. So let me give you an example from my own work on the US. In the US in the early 20th century, Jews and non-Jews and even anti-Semites agreed on some things about Jewish masculinity. And here they think Jewish masculinity is different from other kinds of white masculinity. For example, they thought that Jews tended to be nonviolent. And here they have particularly in mind Jewish men. For Jews, this fit into a story about Jewish men as well-educated, as family-oriented men, as community-oriented men. For anti-Semites, this fit into a story about Jewish men as cowardly and physically weak. Um, so in my work, I found uh, what I, that, and I found, I think, echoes of this in um, some of these same stereotypes in Sebastian's book. Nazi propaganda and practices violently targeted Jews. And the reasons that they gave included that Jewish men were weak or traitors or un-German or dirty or needed um, to be re-educated. But it didn't seem that Jewish men were often deemed a threat because they were violent. Here you can think of all sorts of ex other historical examples where a people might be targeted for preemptive violence because they themselves are seen as violent, right? Think for example, the widespread lynching of black men in the Jim Crow South. That is the idea there is that masculinity, black masculinity is bad masculinity because it's violent. Um, but that's not what we're seeing here. Um, so I'd love for Sebastian to just reflect on why these particular bad traits instead of other particular bad traits, um, because I, in my own work, have noticed a, a similar kind of set of trends. Another thing that I appreciated about Sebastian's book is around gender and agency. Um, agency has been a classic term in lots of studies about women. Sometimes it's tempting to ask, and my students will sometimes ask things like this too, um, did women have agency in this time or did they not? But that's not actually a great question. <laughs> in every time and place, women have some agency and they also are subject to some constraints. This in fact is the same for all people everywhere. Even a king can't do everything he wishes. So a good analysis doesn't ask whether or not people have agency. It asks questions that help us understand what the constraints look like, what avenues might be open. So in classic women's studies, this can be things like, what could women do and what was beyond their reach for structural reasons or reasons having to do with power? How could women resist? How could women make change? You can also see some of the stickiness even in these slightly more nuanced questions. What could women do officially and what could they do in practice might be two different questions in many cases. And then we end up asking bigger questions like what counts as resistance? Or what about when women don't want to resist and they support the status quo? So this little detour, um, brings us back to Sebastian's book. I think he takes up the best of this literature by asking more sophisticated questions. In the Third Reich, what was expected of Jewish men? How did they meet those expectations or try to meet those expectations and how did they resist them? Um, note that even this kind of framing recognizes both constraint and a kind of limited agency. 
How did Nazi expectations align with Jewish ex expectations? And where did the two conflict? Sebastian shows that, for example, both Jews and non-Jewish Germans associated military service with proper manhood. That meant that Jewish men could sometimes use past military service to make arguments for their own worth and belonging, even in the face of anti-Semitic policies and cultures. It also meant that Nazi propaganda and actions had to work harder to discredit the manhood of Jewish men who had served in the military. Gender is made up of both external norms, if you will, and a person's performance of those norms. Um, Sebastian cites Judith Butler on this. An individual's gender comes to be the interaction of herself or himself and the cultural world that they find themselves in. When Sebastian approaches gender in this way, he can tell a history that is neither a story of complete abjection, that's the helpless Jewish men just like sheep to the slaughter kind of story, and he also avoids the story of triumph, how Jewish men really and truly fully resisted and kept their manhood intact in spite of Nazi hate. Um, what I appreciate about this story is it's really far more nuanced than either one of those, and in that way becomes um, a much better window into both the history and why it might matter for contemporary situations. Uh, my third set of interests or questions is a little bit shorter and Sebastian actually <laughs> addressed some of this in his introduction today, but I'm interested in a slightly broader scope for a minute. Um, my question, it's about the focus on 1933 to 41 and what would happen if we thought of this as a longer story. Um, so I wonder what you would say, Sebastian, do you see what you found here continuing into um, the years, the war years later, um, are these same kinds of trends and stereotypes um, intensified in camps? Um, and when people are in hiding, do we get new developments around um, masculinity, new ways to weaponize masculinity? Or, or would you see continuity? Um, I know that your study is focused on these pre-war years for a bunch of great reasons you've described, but just to put your work in conversation with some of the other work you know, do you see a lot of continuity there or are there distinctive things um, to this period that we would see differently if we were looking at um, the later years? Uh, and my last question um, is, as a person who's also written a whole book about masculinity, I wanted to share this thing that I thought a lot about. Um, I think it's fair to say for that for a very long time, general history has focused on men. It looked at male leaders and male thinkers, it has male heroes and male villains. Um, and it often overlooked women or just assumed that whatever was important for men was probably also important for women unless there was a really compelling reason it was different. Um, women's historians, as you know, said, hey, wait, we've been telling all these histories about basically half the population and assuming that men's experiences can stand in for everyone's experiences. Um, so they called for finding new sources, telling new stories, and even noticing what sources and stories we didn't have access to because of reasons of gender. Um, these recovery projects and reinterpretations are still going on, and there's lots more that we still need to know about women and gender history. Um, so here's the question. Why should we study men when there are already so many studies of men? Um, what do we learn from studying men as men? I obviously have my own answers to these questions, and I think there are good answers out there, but I'm really curious to hear um, what you think we can learn from these studies of men as men, these studies of masculinity. What do they contribute beyond obviously the new information, but do they also contribute something to our theoretical models, um, to our methodologies, to the questions we might ask in the future? So thanks so much for sharing your exciting book with me and I look forward to hearing a little more from you. That's excellent. And I think that we'll just go back to Sebastian before we uh, go to any questions. So, Yeah, sounds good. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, lots of thought provoking thoughts there and comments. And of course, now the challenge is to spit out a perfect answer, right? But I think this is something, uh, 
this is more like the beginning of a conversation, of course. And I, likely the second we finish the Zoom talk, I will have a great answer present and then I probably will email it to you or someone else. Um, okay, so let's go through this one by one relatively quickly so we can have other questions as well. The first question was on, yeah, how I kind of, if I understood this correctly, kind of demarcate or distinguish between Jewish masculinity, and Nazi masculinity, if there's kind of an inherent overlap or not. Um, yeah, I think there is an overlap and like you rightly pointed out, I mean, we have this kind of conception by gender scholars of hegemonic ma masculinity, marginalized masculinity, subordinate masculinity, et cetera, et cetera. And if we use as a starting point, this conception of a hegemonic masculinity, kind of a mainstream masculinity, something that the majority of, of, of people in society, men and women can accept, so to speak, and strive towards gaining, not necessarily a reality, but at least something that is accepted and that we want to move towards, so to speak. And yeah, I think we see a, a lot of overlap, so to speak, because again, German and non, and sorry, non-Jewish German and Jewish Germans, they did share these kinds of values when it comes to the notions of citizenship, of, of militarism, of, of German patriotism, or of course, the more traditional patriarchal uh, kind of uh, understandings of gender that men are supposed to have a job, take care of their families, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that kind of overlap really lingers and continues well into the 1930s. And in, in that sense, Nazi Germany was was not as, as as reformist as sometimes we might think, or as radical, for lack of a better word here. But it did kind of discover the nuances or differences. Um, for instance, when it comes to the use of violence or the propaganda and whatnot. I mean, of course, when the Nazis tried to emasculate German Jewish men um, or or masculinity, so to speak, of course they reacted in a negative way, so to speak, saying, "No, we cannot identify with this. We have opposite uh, notions and understandings, so to speak." A, they tried to prove the military masculinity that were service, the medals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was a dichotomy, right? There's a, there's a there's not a contradiction, yeah, a dichotomy, a, 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 a disagreement, so to speak. Another interesting example that comes to my mind is the use of violence in concentration camps. So when German Jewish men, for instance, tried to kind of, you know uphold these, these more maybe romantic, more noble kind of notions of military masculinity. They saw themselves as, you know, as fighters, as patriots, as, as, as true heroic soldiers who fought for their country, who fought other soldiers in the First World War, who would not harm innocent civilians, defenseless civilians, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of quite striking how in some of the diaries and memoirs, these Jewish men not only portray themselves as World War I veterans, but how at the same time they kind of make fun of these Nazi thugs, these 20 year olds who have absolutely no idea what it means to be a soldier and what it means to use violence or showing toughness in a proper way. Because harming innocent defenseless civilians in the Jewish mind of these Jewish men that I looked at was not the manly thing, so to speak. So they actually deny masculinity of the Nazi perpetrators. I mean, what's that all about? It's like a full circle, so to speak. And yeah, it, it, it was quite, quite, quite fascinating. Actually, now that I think about it, it's not just limited to physical violence. It's also the language, just this first level, the discursive. And many would say, you know, we, 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 we experience, we consume the Nazi anti-Semitism, the language, the vulgarism, uh, these, 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 these images and whatnot. That's not a manly thing to do. All you're showing here is that you have this power in this microcosm called the camp and whatnot, but you are not really a man. You have never proven yourself. You haven't fought in the first world war and whatnot. So it's really a kind of a disagreement in terms of what it means to be a man, so to speak. So yes, there's the overlap and there's also these, these striking differences. And, yeah, maybe that's something I could think about more or stress more in that one chapter. Okay, I'm talking more about it than I thought, but that's just it's just an interesting topic, <laughs> I think. Um, agency, women participate, yes. Yeah, I don't think I really saw the question you talked about agency. I fully agree. I mean, we really have to be nuanced, we have to be careful not to generalize, and the deeper we dig, and maybe that this is something that my national focused case study allowed me to do is to see all these differences, these nuances, this mosaic of different reactions um, uh, in all these kinds of different realms, you know, Jewish men trying to be or continue being or playing these, these roles, performing these roles. Some were successful in their self understandings. Or oh, that's another interesting thing. The family's social context, they thought my father, my husband, etc, etc, was great fought really hard, worked really hard, 
and was really a man and kept that family together and safe as long as possible and perhaps enabled us to emigrate in 1938 to Canada, the States or whatnot. Whereas many other cases, we see these reflections of say children or wives saying, my father, my husband is breaking down. He, it's, it's quite a pity, so to speak, to see him in this turmoil, in this kind of despair and whatnot. They wouldn't clearly communicate this with their men at the time, perhaps never, not even after the war, but it's really interesting how not a metro to your post, but it, the, the, to see that the full spectrum of agencies and how some kind of, yeah, were in their self understandings more successful in trying to normalize and trying to persevere, whereas others uh, were less so. And the other point about uh, was it, yeah, con that's a great question. Continuity is so moving into the war years 41, 45. Is there new developments and whatnot? I tried to hint at it already a little bit when I talked about this one academic article that I published on, on, on Jewish men living in the underground. I think it's a completely different story now. And we see in a sense that again goes back to feminist historians who have looked at this first. We see women taking a very proactive role saying, okay, I need to get out again, wartime. Germany, the Holocaust is happening. Women kind of, we use the word submarine, or historians use the word submarine. You hide, say, Three quarters of a day, you emerge for a few hours trying to find a new hiding place, new shelter, trying to find some food. If there's a good Samaritan, so to speak, you know, you can knock on his or her door, maybe you get a few potatoes or whatnot. Um, so the different story here is that really women played, they always played an important role, just to make that clear. But the roles changed a little bit, as in that Jewish men were more forced or confined to passive roles because of that higher risk status of to speak, because they could get detected in the end, circumcision is something um, um, that comes to mind, or, or, or yeah, just being a middle-aged, able-bodied, I love that word that you meant, but being an able-bodied male, middle-aged, during the war, you were supposed to fight at the front, and it just raised suspicions, so to speak, so there are changes, I would say, within Germany once the war starts, and then when it comes to the Holocaust itself, if we focus our lens and go east, so to speak, into the ghettos, into the concentration camps and whatnot, then I think it's really hard to compare the pre-war era with the, with the war era, so to speak. I think when it comes to pure survival in the ghettos, for instance, um, gender roles were still there and were still important and various Jewish men and women so tried to uphold these, two, uh, these gender roles. But I think they were radically attacked and, and, and the focus was more on survival, so to speak. So what I'm trying to say is, I guess, children became breadwinners and everyone had to work together. It's not just, okay, the pre-established notion is the man has to work, kids have to go to school, and the traditional housewife stays at home and takes care of the kitchen and whatnot. No, this is all radically overthrown, so to speak. It's survival, find food, find some job in the, in the ghetto. And more often, well, not more often than not, but often it was actually the children who really, really... Uh, start to play a, a crucial role in, in, in maintaining family subsistence. Uh, obviously, I'm referring to some established uh, scholarship here uh, that looks at children during the Holocaust and what kind of important roles they played for family survival. But I think what, one thing we have to really keep in mind here, of course, is once the Holocaust starts, the focus is on mass murder, whereas in the pre-war years, the focus is, say, persecution, discrimination, possibly deportation of German Jews from German lands, et cetera, et cetera. But once the focus is on, on murder, the Jewish reaction is on survival and not trying to live a normal life, so to speak, because nothing there was normal anymore. Um, anything else? No more. Yeah, so once murder, for instance, starts, and from the perpetrator's perspective, I would say there's less of an attempt, you know, to emasculate, to, to kind of circulate gender stereotypes, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that Nazis tried to bring home the message in the pre-war years, trying to disseminate Nazi anti-Semitism, trying to galvanize perhaps enough Germans to, 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 to accept, to, to, yeah, to internalize Nazi anti-Semitism. But then 10 years later or so, yeah, the focus was on, on, on the genocide and murder, not so much on convincing German society or European society on the evilness of Jews. So I, I see this more in terms of an evolution, kind of a radicalizing stages, so to speak. Um, but gender never disappears in terms of surviving the survival methods and in terms of the Nazi Nazi attack. Though of course, in the end, Nazis did not distinguish between killing men or women or children. Um, anything else? Why study men? I don't know. Why study men? Um, final question. I, I think it's a great question, almost philosophical. Um, 
Well, I, I, I walk into my classrooms when I teach gender and say, you know what, guys, gender is not a niche. It shouldn't be a niche. It shouldn't. When we, when we teach a class 13 weeks, whatnot, and I present you the course outline, 12 weeks, we do mainstream history. And the last class at the end of the semester, we do gender. I don't think we, we should do this anymore. We really have to overcome it. And I think gender, gender understandings, gender analysis should be part of our job as historians, it's mainstream, it's everywhere, it's pervasive. And it, if we want to make sense of the past, we want to study the past, we want to create empathy, uh, we can do that without gender. And gender includes, of course, men. Uh, we want to understand past actors, we want to understand what motivated an agency, their reactions, their lived experiences, how they reacted, how they tried to maintain agency, how they lost agency, et cetera, et cetera. Gender is indispensable, uh, it, it's intersectional, right? I mean, I'm not, making an argument here saying, hey, we should look at class, hey, we should look at uh, whatnot. This is all established, this is, this is normal now, that since 1945, right? We are part of that generation of historians who take gender, who take class, who take other identities at heart, so to speak. And I think that's, that's just, yeah, I, I'm sure I come up with a better answer in five minutes or whatnot. But one of the things I try to emphasize, actually, now I think about it in my book is, yeah, again, that aspect of intersectionality, right? Gender is my main focus, but that's not the beginning. It's not the end. It's not everything. We need to include um, class. Well, race is a bad word, I think, in this context, or ethnicity or notions of citizenship. But another really, really important one that I think is going to become increasingly important in scholarship is age. Age is an age. And I think that really, really showed me also differences within the experience um, of German Jews. A younger male had a better chance, of course, to survive a concentration camp uh, than an older one. So it actually gives a bit of the irony, right? The older one might be the World War I veteran, might perform military masculinity, but it's just not as able-bodied anymore as the younger one, whereas the younger one might not have fought in the First World War, but actually might have learned internalized military masculinity, say, from their peers, from their fathers, family, et cetera, et cetera. So military masculinity is not restricted to the participation in World War I. Anyways, I think I'll better be quiet here. And well, I, I would jump in here to, you know, I'm going to quote you from just 30 minutes ago or so um, to open up on our audience questions, which even a couple of them have texted to me instead of typing into the chat. But um, Nazi terror was gendered, uh, was one of the short, sweet comments that you had in your in your talk. Um, and I think that that's, that's deceptively absolutely true. They weren't just victimizing Jews as Jews or victimizing Jews as men or women, but victimizing them um, in ways that attacked their uh, masculine or feminine conceptions of self. Um, what, and we're in the UW-Madison crowd here, so what um, Mary Louise Roberts has called gender damage. Um, so I think that that's, that's a great way to jump into this conversation. Um, one of the questions that um, I'd like to give you is, I think kind of following up on one of Sarah's comments, um, asking you if you could put into some more words, was there a, a Jewish masculinity? Um, this is very much taken from some uh, questions that Sarah opened. And I was kind of fixating on that as we went through. What what was Jewish about the masculinity being attacked in camps or in street or daily life? Was it a very um, assimilated German masculinity all the time? Or was there a way to attack Jews as Jews that you saw in the research? Yeah, I think that's that's a that's an excellent question. Um, and it goes back to methodology and research. I mean, I think often as historians, we are in a sense limited right to the sources that we have available that present themselves to us when i walked into this research project yeah 10 years ago or so i had a few other case studies actually in mind that i really wanted to look into including sexuality including the body and there was just very little references or a few references within that source material that i looked at and it turned out yeah the people who did write diaries and letters or memoirs after the war were often highly acculturated, secularized German Jews. But that's another case study that I wanted to explore more. That's, of course, Sarah's specialty, right? A religion. Like, what role would Jewish Judaism play 
for these German Jewish families and Jewish men in resisting the Nazi onslaught, so to speak. Is there an intersection with, or is there an intersection between religion and, and gender? And, and, and I'm certain there is, and I've come across it in, in, in the literature. I just didn't really come across it in the primary source material that I looked at. And my best guess is um, that, yeah, of the 550,000 German Jews, the, the, really the vast majority was highly acculturated and relatively secular or chose not to write about religion for one reason or another. And it was maybe these people, more upper class, more educated, who thought religion was perhaps secondary. Or I did just did a lousy job and I didn't really read between the lines fine enough to see how these authors tried to connect religion and gender. So in a sense, I consider my book highly incomplete. And the first book review that I mentioned, um, why I didn't, or if I could connect and intersect politics and gender. What about say Jewish communists, socialists who were very active in say German cities like Hamburg, Berlin, et cetera, et cetera. Did their political understandings and convictions shape gender and vice versa? So long story short, back to Chad's question, is there a singular masculinity or Jewish masculinity? I would say no. Uh, it can be driven by politics. Zionism is another keyword here that I hardly touch on in my story. And again, not because I ignored it or I didn't think it's important or interesting. Again, it's sometimes just the sources that drive us, right? And I, so for, yeah, exactly for that reason, there's not a singular Jewish masculinity. There's the more orthodox Jew, German Jews, the lone minorities, say 10, 20 percent. Um, there's the more mainstream, acculturated, more secularized Jews, predominantly the ones that I looked at. Um, there's Zionist uh, camps, so to speak, as well. Um, there's sexuality, there's the body. So there's a number of, of case studies that I think I or some others, of course, still have to look at, so to speak. I really see this book more as a starting point and definitely not as a as a as the, as the final as the final word, so to say, when it comes to this kind of research. Well, if we just take a couple more, I have one that's from one of my own students. So I'd like to really slip this one in. Um, sure. Could you talk about whether or not there's I think the, the answer is almost jumps out, but whether or not there's a contradiction in the ways that Nazis are describing Jewish men. Um, are they trying to have their cake and eat it too? And the Jewish men are weak, but then at the same time, there's another side of the propaganda. The Jewish men are rapacious, Jewish men are sexually aggressive. Um, how are they squaring that circle, so to speak? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, that's where I use terms like pseudoscientism, being illogical, or et cetera. 100% agree. Uh, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. On the one hand, you portray Jewish male as effeminate, as unworthy of being soldiers, war shirkers, didn't contribute in the First World War, you know, being the desk uh, um, soldiers behind the front who never saw frontline combat, et cetera, et cetera. And they're just not physically made to be soldiers, so to speak. They are that, it, it, it's racistly explained, so to speak. And of course, this goes back to, you know, the, the, the kind of racism and kind of the racist theory, eugenics and whatnot in the 19th century, some that high Rosenberg and whatnot, the ones that influenced Hitler, so I'm, I'm thinking, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the same time, exactly, we have these, these, these doctrines or these, these, these discourses, I should say, of, of racial racial defilement, class and shanda, the Jewish man is portrayed as lecherous, as aggressive, as a rapist, as someone that can't be trusted. You can't send your kids or wife, or sorry, an Aryan innocent, blonde, blue-eyed, um, and weak woman to a Jewish doctor, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't make up, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I don't think we should make the attempt to, to, to see Nazism as a logical um, kind of a, kind of a ideology. I think it's a hybrid, it's a mix of a lot of different cultural discourses that often originated in the 19th century or prior that come together, they get hybridized, so to speak, um, but that, yeah, honestly don't make sense. And uh, of course, the, 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 the victims themselves pointed that out, that contradiction. How am I denied from, say, joining the military? I'd like to join the military. I looked at Jewish men who wanted to join the military in 1935. They felt really excluded and, and angry. They said, I want to serve in the, if, for my country that I still strongly identified with, et cetera, et cetera. And you are telling me I'm not worthy. I'm too weak. I'm, you know, having all these kinds of traits. That's just not true. And then I see in Nazi newspapers to Stürmer and whatnot, yeah, that apparently I am so aggressive and so uncontrollable and whatnot. 
So I think the circle could close and saying Jews were um, assigned aggressiveness, dominance, physical prowess and whatnot too much. So it's not hegemonic, it's not normal anymore, it's abnormal, it's too much, so to speak. But then again, does that close the cycle and say, well, are you now weak and fragile or are you too much? It is two sides of the same coin, so to speak, but how can we reconcile these contradictions? It's an excellent question. Thank you. Well, um, I thank you for introducing your book to us today and Professor Imhoff for your comments. I want to pitch back to you if you have anything you'd like to wrap up with or I'll say thanks. You mean me or Sarah? Uh, Sarah. Thank you. I mean, yeah, just this has been a great discussion. It was a pleasure to read the book and then to learn more from you. All right. Well, thank you to Sebastian Hugel and to Sarah Imhoff. And we will hopefully see you again uh, in future semesters at these book events. And uh, just thanks again to our sponsors and to our speaker and commentator. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.